In the 1960s, young people started to become concerned about the injustices they saw in the political and social system of the country. The young generation formed what was called the New Left. They believed the small wealthy elite controlled politics and wealth was unfairly divided throughout the nation. From the New Left movement arose the Students for a Democratic Society. Led by Tom Hayden, Rennie Davis, and Todd Gillen, the SCS called for an end to apathy and an end to the acceptance of a country run by big corporations. The SCS made their goals very clear when they issued the Port Huron Statement in 1962. The statement declared how the SCS felt we need to disengage ourselves entirely from the system being presented. At first, the SES focused on poverty, nuclear power, and racism, but as the Vietnam War progressed, SDS chapters began to focus their attention on protesting the war. As the Vietnam War grew larger, university students and faculty members across the nation began to call for teach-ins, a time in which the students and faculty could discuss and debate issues such as the war in a classroom setting. Teach-ins were just the beginning, as the unrest with the war spread throughout campuses everywhere. The most prominent universities in protests of the war were Berkeley and Columbia. At Berkeley, students formed the Vietnam Day Committee, a group that would organize peaceful demonstrations against the war. In mid-October of 1965, about 10,000 protesters marched from Berkeley to Oakland, but were stopped by the city police. A month later, protesters were able to complete the seven-mile march in protest of the war. Next, on November 30th, students set up an anti-war table on campus to compete with the Navy recruiting table. The university allowed the Navy to keep their table, but claimed the peace table was against school regulations. Police were called and students were arrested. The protesting didn't stop there. In October of 1967, students held a forbidden anti-draft rally on campus in which two students were suspended. In response, 15,000 protesters occupied Sproul Hall for two days. The protests continued on the campus of Berkeley and similar events broke out at Columbia. At Columbia in May of 1965, students blocked participants of the Naval Reserve Officer Training Corps, or NROTC, from entering the Lowe Library. The SCS also organized an interference with CIA recruitment on campus and a sit-in to prevent CIA interviews from happening. October of 1967, Mark Rudd, the leader of the SDS chapter at Columbia, declared, Let us clearly state that our goal is to end university complicity with the war, including IDA, NROTC, CIA contracts, and recruiting. The protests at Columbia continued with a sit-in to prevent Marine Corps recruitment, picket lines, and an SDS demonstration in Lowe Library to protest university affiliation with the Institute for defense analysis. This statement appeared in the Cox Commission report on the outbreak at Columbia. The university became the focus of both criticism and frustration whenever it could be linked with the defense establishment. In furnishing class rankings to draft boards, in making facilities available for ROTC programs, in permitting recruitment for the armed forces or war-related industries and in government research. On the war, therefore, even more than on other issues, the university became a surrogate for society. In 1969, as the protests continued, many SDS members started to become frustrated that the nonviolent methods were failing to change the war. At the June 1969 SDS convention, the group was split into two, the Weathermen and the Progressive Labor Party. The Weathermen got their name from the lyrics, You don't need a weatherman to know which way the wind blows, a line from Bob Dylan's Subterranean Homesick Blues. The Weathermen advocated for violence against the government and Vietnam policies. In October of 1969, the Weathermen went on a violent rampage through the streets of Chicago in order to publicize the group but it ended in a violent fight between protesters and police, which became known as the Days of Rage. In December of 1969, the weathermen decided to go underground by using false identities and living in safe houses. They were responsible for more than 20 bombings from 1969 to 1975, including the bombings of police headquarters, service offices, ROTC buildings, the U.S. Capitol building, and the Pentagon. 
The FBI said the Weather Underground Organization, which took credit for the bombing, is the same radical group which was responsible for the bombing of the U.S. Capitol in 1971 and the Pentagon in 1972. But federal officials don't really know much about the group, which is believed to have between 20 and 30 members. My name is Bernadine Dorn, and I was part of the Weather Underground from, well, it's hard to say when it started, 1970 to 1980. It's underground for 11 years. There's no way to be committed to nonviolence in the middle of the most violent society that history's ever created. I'm not committed to nonviolence in any way. I'm a teacher now in a community college, and um, I'll, my students will occasionally bring up the war in Vietnam and ask me what, what my involvement was. And I'll say, well, I helped found an organization whose goal was the violent overthrow of the government of the United States. And people would, my students would look at me as if I'm from another planet. This system is going to be overthrown. It's going to mean a fight. And it's going to mean a lot of white people risking a lot of things when they finally join on the side of the black people and the people of Vietnam and around the world who have already begun the fight. I'm not going to tell you, oh, I walked in here this day and put a bomb here, or I made this here, or I blew up this car, or I held up this bank. I mean, there were armed robberies. There were all armed robberies, uh, uh, terrorism. You know, there was all kinds of things that went down that are illegal. So I, uh, I tell you that we did them, but I'm not going to tell you which ones I did or who did what, because I, I just can't do that. My name's David Gilbert. Uh, I'm now in Comstock Prison doing a life bid. In terms of mistakes we made, I'm willing to take responsibility, pay a price. I, you know, I, I really haven't complained too much about my own personal situation. Uh, but was I fighting for a just cause? Was well, that's the motivation? Was there a, a need to do something about what was going on? Yes, there was. Through the Panther 21, she held the real criminals, power to the people.